Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Carl June. We heard him um, in the plenary talk, and now he will talk about adoptive T cell therapy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I introduced uh, the concept uh, this morning, and um, uh, disclosing again my relationship with Novartis. So, um, stepping back from adoptive T cell therapy, we have a r broad range of cell and gene therapeutics uh, that are now enough, showing enough uh, efficacy that the regulatory aspects actually, I think, are lagging behind. And that's what I'll discuss some of the issues there. Um, it's the regulation in uh, uh, Europe is quite different in some aspects of cell manufacturing or vector manufacturing than it is in the US. So we don't have the harmonization that we do with other uh, compounds that have been around and under development for many time, many years. Um, and um, so I've encountered issues both when we do first in human studies and, and the regulation of those for cell therapies. Uh, uh, I'll discuss some of the cell manufacturing and then regulatory approval process. Oops. Um, so one thing I didn't talk about this morning is the, that both T cell receptor and CARs are being developed, um, and they have very different profiles. So the T cell receptor has, um, a, a natural T cell receptor has uh, an affinity uh, for its target, which is an MHC peptide, usually a nonomer, uh, and it's a trivalent uh, uh, interaction between the T cell receptor the MHC molecule and the peptide bound in the group. That's in general um, a micromolar to up to maybe 10 nanomolar affinity constant. Antibodies can be engineered over a broad range. Um, the one we use is around one nanomolar as a car, as a single chain variable fragment. Um, and it doesn't require the MHC molecule uh, to be there. So very big difference in avidity, um, but now with receptor engineering, uh, companies such as Adapmune can vary uh, via um, a phage selection technology the affinity of the T cell receptor over a thousand fold. Um, and one of the reasons many T cell receptors for cancer have failed is that the affinity of the natural receptors are low because uh, and the body has tolerance to them. And, and so their approach is to engineer up the affinity to similar to what's found in um, natural responses against viral proteins where there isn't tolerance. So the, the proteome that's targeted is very different. The T cell receptors target intracellular libraries in the cancer genome, and the uh, CARs target only surface structures. We have a paper this week that actually came out in Immunity describing targeting a glycoepitope on a, a hypoglycosylated epo epitope called a TN. So there it's uh, only a sugar that's being targeted that's cancer specific by the car. Um, so T cell receptors require that you have MHC molecule expression. Many tumors down regulate that. In fact, that's how they escape being killed by the immune system. So in particular, tumors like brain cancer have very low levels of MHC expression and, and that can be limiting. T cell, a natural T cell can't kill a cell that's MHC deficient. Um, we know in both cases now with follow-up that the T, the T cell receptor modified cells or CAR modified cells can persist for very long periods of time, essentially life span of a human. So the uh, half-life of our, the CARs that we've used, first used patients in, with HIV in 1997, the, is, uh, s the mean projected half-life is between 17 and 23 years. So that's a um, very long time. And um, so they, they are, uh, um, uh, you know, living drugs both in both cases. Um, one major difference we found is that when you have changed the specificity of the T cell receptor, it can be difficult to predict the toxicity. So um, whereas antibody-based CAR binding is, is, I think, much more standard, it's those uh, technologies exist in industry to develop, to detect uh, protein expression with antibody binding, but it's not true. For MHC peptide, a T cell receptor can need only 10 targets. So 10 peptide MHC molecules is enough to trigger the T cell receptor. And we don't have a technology at this time to detect that 
um, and, and screen other tissues for off-target recognition. Um, okay, so the cells are living drugs. That really means that it's a very different regulatory approach than something that's administered and then goes away with, with standard PK. Um, another principle that's come, that we've learned is that the cell that actually is, after it's infused in the patients, they proliferate and can evolve. And we have seen them go from central memory cells to effector cells and back again to stem cell-like T cells. So the cell that actually may cure a patient is not necessarily what's been infused. What the FDA will regulate is the cell we infused, but what we want is the cells to evolve in the patient. And uh, so that's something that's it's a very, we, we, can monitor, monitor, uh, we can monitor that in patients by serial uh, biopsies and, and checking the status of the CAR T cells. So when we infuse, for instance, a bulk population of CD4 cells and CD8 cells that have the CARs, the ratio of those will change over time in the patient. Um, and, and so they are evolving living drugs. Uh, another principle is that autologous cells in general are safe. Uh, there have been very few issues with autologous. With allogeneic cells, the regulatory challenges go much higher, risk of GBH, transmitted viral infections, and so on go up. Um, I mentioned this in the talk this morning, just that the genotoxicity data shows so far that modifying T cells with various platforms, such as zinc finger nucleases, retroviruses, and lentiviruses, ha has been safe with no, uh, 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 there are no cases reported where the cells have transformed. Um, and, and this is a slide from Chris Roy at George Institute of Technology, um, uh, who has been looking at the, the issue of engineering cells and, and turning it into an industry, which is, it has been ignored until just very recently. So there are a number of things to consider that he lists here, uh, harvesting, isolating, the expansion, differentiation, purity, and how you deliver and store cells. So the supply chain is very different for a frozen living cell than it is for a, a, a one product that's mass produced. Um, another issue we've come up in is how you design trials for cell therapies and biologics, and that's very different than it is for drug therapies. Um, so uh, in biologics, the toxicity is usually due to uh, exaggerated pharmacology. It's often on target. For instance, we see cytokine release syndrome, uh, and that's related to tumor burden, and it's an on-target effect. Um, whereas drugs more often have their limiting toxicity or off-target. Um, and uh, so how you dose with a drug that's self-replicating is very different than, than how you give a drug that's metabolism. So our dose of CAR T cells in patients with leukemia appears to be related to um, uh, the patient's age and then also to tumor burden. So the tumor actually causes the CAR cells to expand. We need less cells of the T cells in patients who have higher tumor burden. So that's counterintuitive. Um, we find that the T cells from pediatric patients work better on a per cell basis than adults. And, and I mean, if you know, I mean, just the aging immune system, in people o older than age 65, a flu vaccine, standard FDA approved flu vaccine only works 50% of the time, whereas it works almost all the time in young, young people. So, so the, the biggest determinants of the cell therapies that we have so far found is tumor burden and age of the patient uh, as far as dosing the cells. Um, um, this is from a colleague at the FDA, Ying Wang. Um, and when they look at our, our tox packages for cell therapies, um, they, you know, one, one issue is metabolism of a, of a living repro uh, reproducing cell is very different than one that's a drug that's given and metabolized and uh, excreted. So our trials are defined not to determine a maximum tolerated dose, but rather um, so-called OBD, the optimal biologic dose. So that's a principle in general of biologics and cell therapies. To, and um, so we generally have just one or two cell dose levels in our trials, and, and it appears what we have to do is have a sufficient dose, as in sensors in a, in a bone marrow transplant, you have to have enough cells to engraft. So it's very different than standard oncology development where one's trying to identify a maximum tolerated dose. 
Um, and this, this here is a slide um, showing some, I mean, when we first start a trial, how do you decide what the first in human dose is for the cells? Um, with standard pharma, the, the approach has been over the years is to conduct studies in animals and determine the so-called Noella folk, the, the no observed adverse effect level in animals and over a period of a month. And then at the end of this, uh, convert it on a body surface area to get the human equivalent dose. And then, then you take an arbitrary tenfold reduction in that, and that's the starting dose. Um, that's classic pharmacology. With uh, bio biologic cell therapies, um, the, the paradigm that we're following now is so-called the MABEL, find the minimally anticipated biologic effect level. For instance, if you're targeting a receptor on a cell, for instance, with an antibody that you just heard Mark Chu describe, you can know how many cells there are in the body, perhaps, and how many receptors there would be then in the body, and then what fraction of receptor occupancy you want. So that you could calculate how much drug you would need to give to give, say, 10% or 90% receptor occupancy. We know that in the case of tumors, a tumor is about a kilogram. Uh, a kilogram of tumor is about 10 to the 12th cells. And we know that T cells kill on a one-to-one -one basis, I mean, and they can do this serially. So one T cell can kill multiple tumor targets, or they can also do it by proliferation and daughter cells. So our, in the end, we need a, an effective T cell dose that's about equivalent to the tumor mass the patient has. And we can get there in two ways. We can either give a, a lot of cells, or we can give cells that replicate. And, and we've used uh, both strategies. Um, um, I mentioned the geographic disparity in where clinical trials are right now for uh, CAR T cell trials um, that involve gene transfer technology, uh, with most of the trials underway in, in, in U.S. or China. Um, and there are some potential explanations that are listed here, um, one being um, uh, the financial resources to support the research and translation. Um, the funding for the basic science is equivalent in Europe as it is in Europe, U.S. In fact, it's maybe larger per capita. Um, but then there's the history of the society very much determines its risk tolerance. And um, so some, some societies are much more um, uh, risk averse and, than others. And um, so that in, explains in part the, the difference in tolerance when you go to to Asia, to Japan, to Europe, to U.S. on uh, where trials are open and, and whether they're early adopters or not. Um, this is a list of some of the things that need to be developed for manufacturing reproducibly of, of cell therapies such as I described. Um, so as far as I know right now, this is the only industry which doesn't have a standard. So there is no NIST, and that's what we need for cell therapies. Um, so right now, if I say that I'm infusing 10 to the 8th cells per kilo in a patient, the way I measure cells is not standardized in any way that, that's done in another institution. So we need very much to have standards so that we can have reproducible results and the industry is in a, in a, in a catch up mode to develop this and it needs to be done with uh, the regula regulators. Um, and um, so uh, this, this just again says that, that with these, these engineering issues now that need to be developed. The science is ahead of the engineering and cell manufacturing, and then that's ahead of the regulatory bodies. So, so they're playing catch up because the, the clinical results happen rapidly with these cell therapies, and uh, having a harmonized approach right now to, to commercial development is really desperately needed, um, uh, and, and uh, hopefully we'll have it. There have been two things recently in the U.S. that have changed uh, as far as regulation of of uh, cell therapies. Uh, one was uh, an Institute of Medicine or IOM report about a year and a half ago, um, which changed it. It was stated that every gene transfer protocol had to go through a recombinant advisory committee, which is, meets on a quarterly basis. That's not true for other kinds of therapies in the U.S., so there's been a different regulatory pathway if you're a gene-modified cell therapy than if you are, say, a, a targeted nanoparticle. And um, so that's now changing, but, um, and this is some of the uh, details that you can find um, on the website from the National Institute of Health Director 
on some of the implications of this. So they're not now reviewing all protocols as they did, and it's done more on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the other issue that's coming through the U.S. is you know, more of a political issue in Congress is the so-called 21st Century Cures Act, and um, this is, has some impl implications on breakthrough therapies. It requires, for instance, that companies uh, have uh, um, expanded access for any therapy they're having even before it's uh, fully approved. And um, with that, I'll just turn. This is a list of things that need to be developed, and they need to be, um, I think, harmonized um, if we're going to be efficiently developing uh, cell and gene therapies. And I'll stop with that. So in the tumor microenvironment. So in general, um, we, we, I mean, we have data that the CAR T cells kill in a, uh, I mean, it's target-dependent killing. And, um, and you know, you can observe this under video microscopy. They kill one at a time. Sometimes they can actually engage two, one CAR T cell can engage two cancer targets and kill them both at the same time. Then they disengage and then we'll move to another target. Um, immunotherapies may also enlist other parts of the immune system. So it's, it's possible that, for instance, with T-cell therapies that you may activate macrophages and NK cells. And so when I say one-to-one, -one, I mean that's a, uh, uh, I mean that's an approximation. Um, but um, it does explain, I think, a lot of the past failures of vaccines where when we now have tetramers and so on, we can measure the vaccine approach. We know that the number of tumor cells, I mean, tumor-specific T cells, was, was logs below the number of, of, of tumor cells. And so when you do the calculations, and we've shown this in our publications, when we treat patients and we see these expansions in the patients, the total number of T cells is about a kilogram. I mean, it's an incredible um, proliferation of cells. So, um, when you get a major viral infection, such as Epstein-Barr virus or mono, about 20% of all your T cells, so nearly a kilo, will become Epstein-Barr specific. So when we have a major, you know, uh, viral infection, that's what happened. Our repertoire becomes focused on that pathogen, and then it goes away and down to memory levels. And that's, I think, explains, um, and, and it's what we need to do with cancer therapies, unless we're looking at minimal residual disease. When you talk about the potential of having a standard cell line, so when you mention autologous conversions, that's one aspect, but can the T cell lines be translatable to what you would have for CAR T's? Is that a direction that could be gone or go, to go towards? So I think, right, that's, um, so one approach would be either there's various NK cell lines and T cell lines um, that may be engineerable, if you will, you know, the issues are uh, that they don't have uh, an endogenous T cell receptor anymore so that they can't cause GVH, but also then they avoid NK cell recognition and being, you know, by the host rejecting them. So it, uh, it's very hard to engineer, and as you know from recombinant protein, something that's immunologically silent. It's a, and so T cells that are autologous have done that, but that evolved over millions of years. It's, so that's a very difficult challenge, and I think that's what will be uh, defined whether that's successful or not. You said that the efficacy uh, depends on the fitness of the T cells, um, and I guess also the side effects. So what happens if you move these uh, drugs into, let's say, earlier lines, in particular in indications where you have uh, you know, not an exclusive expression pattern like in solid tumors. So we, you would expect also a higher incidence of, of side effects? Um, I don't think so. So, um, so the question is, I mean, in what we do see in patients with have bulk tumor with lymphomas and uh, leukemias is cytokine release syndrome, and it's related to the amount of tumor the patient has. So if we treat, as you suggest, maybe more earlier upstage, or patients who have minimal residual disease after chemo, it's an outpatient therapy. But if we have patients that have 
um, you know, massive relapse disease, about one third of the patients require uh, um, intensive care treatment at this point. Um, so, so I think there'll be a number, number of strategies to get around that. Um, hopefully, treating in, before their end stage is, is, is the simplest. Now, um, there is a, se a separate issue, which is trafficking. And so T cells very efficiently, in fact, memory T cells in humans live in the bone marrow. Um, not in mice, but in humans, memory T cells are found in the bone marrow. They traffic there very efficiently. Um, if we infuse CAR T cells and look uh, a week later and someone has leukemia, the T, you know, um, T cells can be com you know, just massively throughout the bone marrow. So it takes them about three days to get to the bone marrow, and that's an efficient process. Um, whereas in solid tumors, that may not be so efficient. And, and so th then that means stochastically that, or there may be, um, I think we have synchronized cytokine release in leukemias. The cells get to the bone marrow, and then they see target, and there's massive proliferation. I think in solid tumors, it's more likely to be asynchronous, and therefore there may be less issues with cytokine release syndrome, but that's to be determined. Great. Thank you so okay. much. Next speaker is local.